Hey, good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live from the Dolph Simons Family Studio. We're back with you. It's game day. Oh, no, wait a minute. It's not game day. It's another program about the COVID coronavirus. <laughs> I'm joined on my right by Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Hi. Hawk Guy. He's back with us again this morning. On the left is Dr. Ron Chen, our Chair of Radiation Oncology. He is also joined by Dr. Jamie Wagner, the Division Chief of Breast Surgery and Breast Surgical Oncology here. These are two incredible physicians. You will be delighted to get to know them a little bit better. I think they've both been on the program before. But we have a special presentation this morning to talk a lot about cancer in the age of COVID and what that means. Pretty darn big deal. Hey, it's also a big deal for all you Chief fans out there. I just want to show you, we dress the part, go Chiefs. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Remember the superhero video? Yep, brought them back today. <laughs> These are the magic tennis shoes. The reason why the Chiefs wore the Super Bowl right there, because I had them on right there for the Super Bowl. That's why we won. There you go. <laughs> That's you know, good. At that. But, you know, it's pretty cool stuff out there. Hey, uh, I also want to tell everybody to watch the game tonight, and especially the pregame tonight, for a really special video spotlight involving one of our nurses here. Amanda Gartner, though, is a nurse who is also the head of Infection Prevention and Control. And she is an amazing person and an amazing team leader and an amazing fantasy camp football player. Amanda apparently won all the awards at the fantasy camp. I, you, I played fantasy camp twice. I don't think I won many awards there, but uh, apparently she did and did a great job. She has been working very hard on the front line since the pandemic began. We have an incredible record of safety in general and around infection prevention and control, but especially throughout this pandemic. And Amanda Gardner is at the heartbeat and at the center of the brains for that. She is a, a, a huge Chiefs fan, and we are delighted that she is going to be honored tonight. Pretty darn exciting. Also exciting today is some great work that Hawkeye has been able to pull off. Or really, I think it's your mom. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, my mom's a very talented and, and smart woman. She was able to mask up uh, Patrick as well as Dr. Fauci to help flatten and crush the curve, but also um, the opponents as we go through the next season for the Chiefs. So they are all working that. towards that. I'm, I love keeping Patrick safe, and I love keeping Fauci safe, too. Both right. great leaders for us in different kinds yeah. of ways and uh, pretty special. So how are our numbers today? Numbers are okay. Okay, we have 22 patients in the hospital, so a little bit more than we did um, yesterday, a couple more, but only um, three in the ICU and only one on the ventilator. So that's good. We Again, we still do have five patients on the ventilator that are in our recovery period, so not acute infection. So again, once you do get on the ventilator, it does take some time to get off. It is a long process. Um, and again, we still have, uh, you know, about 30 patients in the hospital who otherwise meet recovering status. So they are not um, considered acute infection. But even if you're not in the ICU, it still does take some time to recover. You still are in the hospital for a little bit. Yeah, so it's a big deal out there, and, and uh, coronavirus is still very real. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Chen, it's been really very real to cancer patients. Yes, and first of all, I just want to say I'm really honored to be at the pregame show today. And so, uh, you know, special We're honor. Delighted, delighted we, to have you here in our pregame really show. Uh, and so, but one of the Did things you have I, remarks about the Chiefs? Are you ready for the part two? <laughs> uh, I, I am ready. It's going right. to be a great game. Awesome. Um, but, you know, one of the things I, I think is really important to, to talk about in terms of COVID, I think everybody knows that the COVID has impacted infections, people have symptoms, they get admitted to the hospital, it can even cause deaths. But something that has not been really talked about very much is the impact of COVID on cancer diagnosis. And so some recent studies have, been, have come out that showed that really in the last several months, COVID has significantly decreased cancer diagnosis. So specifically, a couple of studies have shown that in March of this year, compared to March of last year, cancer diagnosis across this country was down about 25%. And then April this year, compared to April last year, cancer diagnosis was down about 75%. So it's not that COVID cured cancer, but rather people still continue to have cancer, but COVID has really led to a decrease in diagnosis, delayed diagnosis, and I think that could really have a major impact on our cancer patients. Yeah, indeed. So, Jamie, talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing, and thanks for being back on our program this morning. Well, thank you for having me. Um, since we have had the opportunity to really start to expand getting clinics um, open for patients and, and, most importantly, our screening mammography has reopened, 
we are not seeing our volumes quite as high as what they were consistently from a year ago. And where that's becoming a concern is we are still getting diagnoses, but some of our diagnoses that we're seeing at a, I guess at a greater volume are more advanced cancers. And I know that I stated that that was my biggest concern during our huge shutdown during those first six to eight weeks. And unfortunately I'm seeing some of that come to fruition. And I would really love to see um, all patients, but the population that I am most acutely serving, the women, really get back to um, paying attention to their health and getting their screening mammography done. Yeah, this is really important, and, and we're delighted that you guys are out there on the front lines trying to convince people to do that. We've seen the same thing happen with heart disease, and we've seen the same thing happen in cancer. We've seen the same thing happen in lung disease. and. Delay does not mean quality care, and unfortunately, delay can mean more complications and more advanced disease. Well, Jill, welcome back this morning. Thank you. How was Colorado, it was Jill? It was amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. Great time. Well, we're glad you're, you're here. And people can't see Jill, but she's also dressed in red today. Got that game, that game day yep. look. So awesome. I have red shoes, too. Oh, look. I don't know if they're as <laughs> cool as my red tennis runners. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's start with media. Do we have any questions out there from our media colleagues? Not hearing any, Jill, you're up. All right, so Michael wants to know, he's a bladder cancer patient, and he said that he, he wants you to talk more about the unpredicted consequences of people missing cancer screenings. What is your greatest fear, and especially as we go into the fall with an expected perhaps surge in more cases? Yeah, I think this is really important. I think there's really two pieces to the decrease in cancer screening that was, saw, that was seen in these studies. One is I think there is a lot less screening being performed. That's really the first step. So for many cancers, uh, there are screening tests available. So for breast cancer, there's mammogram available. For prostate cancer, there's PSA. Uh, there's colonoscopy for colon cancer. So we know that COVID led to probably cancellation of a lot of these tests that were previously scheduled. So that's really the first part. But there's a second part, because I think a lot of patients who may have an abnormal screening test they need to go through the next step, which is a biopsy, to actually diagnose the cancer. So I think COVID has also led to decrease in biopsies, even for patients who have uh, uh, an abnormal screening test. And so actually, the, the studies have actually shown this. So um, the, in April, mammograms were down 90% in this country. And in April, colonoscopies were down 85% in this country. And so these cancellations, I think now, maybe some people are reluctant to reschedule these canceled tests, but I think it's really important for them to keep up with their screening. And the concern is that because the, the best chance to cure a cancer is when we diagnose it as early as possible. A delay in screening, a delay in diagnosis means that we may catch the cancer at a later stage or even when it's incurable. That's really the major concern uh, from these studies that we saw. So, Jamie, talk to us a little bit. Is that, is that going on out in, in the breast cancer world as well? It, it's got to be. Oh, it definitely is. Um, we have even had women who have come in and they've been able to feel a mass in their breast. So that already is, is showing the advancement of the cancer and they've been able to feel that since May, June, and they've delayed until July for an understandable concern and it just comes down to lack of knowledge um, as to what we're doing to protect our, our patients. And that's why Dr. Chen and I you know, really wanted to participate today to say we're a very, very safe place. Our, our openings um, for how we are now doing screening and bringing patients in has changed dramatically and we have created a very safe environment because um, you know, we, we now have to figure out how to live to the best and healthiest lives we can in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, and, and if people are afraid to come in, is there even a possibility of a telemedicine visit just to kind of get things started? There actually are a lot of opportunities. So some of it may just be that first consultation. It doesn't involve a physical exam, but we can, you can tell me what's going on and what you're feeling and we can direct and really try to consolidate your first in-person visit so that we get any and every piece of imaging that we possibly can. We've even expanded it to the point of um, getting uh, telehealth multidisciplinary clinics available for patients to um, be efficient with their time. So maybe they even have that diagnosis, but they're concerned of following up with that. We have clinics now where they can see the medical oncologist, the radiation oncologist, and the surgeon all via telehealth all at the same time. 
But that that's really remarkable. I, I think as a patient, that would bring great comfort to have that conversation there, and you can probably have multiple members of your family being participant in that conversation with you. Talk, talk to us a little bit, because even, even if you're scared, you don't want to come in, at least if you have that initial discussion, you can also talk about the safety of COVID-19 in the clinic. That's absolutely right. And that is, um, that you just touched on a really great point about family members. As we all understand, and you and um, Dana have been talking about, we're somewhat restricting the number of family members that can be with them, but we have had five, six family members on these visits. It has been so incredibly well received. Um, we are able to give a lot of education on what cancer is, the workup, the different treatment options that may be available to them. And the feedback from patients has just been far superior than honestly I could have expected when we were launching this. We were actually just trying to provide a comfortable environment with easy access to patients, but they have they have really conveyed to us that they have um, been able to do this in the comfort of their own home, which I think is a security feeling to them. But the relationship that they've been able to develop with their providers has been no different than if we were in a face-to-face -face visit. Yeah, that, that, that's really cool, yeah. Dana. And and I, and I would like to say, you know, to Jamie's point, we have been talking about how safe it is because we've taken these measures. Well, there, there are actually several published studies looking at nosocomial spread, meaning spread in the healthcare setting of SARS-CoV-2. And so we aren't just talking about it. There's actual data to support that the spread of COVID-19 in the healthcare setting, again, most of these studies were done on in the inpatient in the hospital, but in these uh, settings, it is much lower of spread um, to people. So from patient to healthcare worker and healthcare worker to patient, because I know all the patients are concerned about getting it. So there's actually good data published saying that the spread um, is extremely low in the healthcare setting from the healthcare worker to the patient. And we are certainly um, very concerned about patient safety, about our healthcare worker safety, so they can continue to come and do the screenings and do the procedures. Um, but we know that from all of this, from all these systems, especially the universal masking, which we are doing, has really cut down on any spread. And the risk of getting it here in the clinics or here in the hospital is very low, and it's extremely low when compared to um, out in the community. Yeah, yeah and I think that's really important because honestly, you know, we hear about hot spots and clusters yeah. and things like that. You know, technically a hospital is a hot spot slash cluster. I mean, how many people do we have today? 22, 23? Yeah, 22. Yeah, that's an entire ward, the ICU. Yeah. I mean, we are a hot spot. Yet, how often do we see disease spread from patients to staff? Correct. We just don't see it. Very and the reason is, any, yeah. the reason is we have good infection prevention and mm -hmm. control. It's all about the pillars, and you can be safe going to see your physician. That's not a hot spot. A hospital's a hot spot, but our staff don't get COVID-19 from our patients. Correct. Despite the fact that people who are actively ill, big concentrations of them, and people don't get it. Why is that? Infection prevention and control really works. Might be a good time to bring up Susan's question. She has an appointment today at the Great Bend Family Clinic, okay. and she noticed that it made the KDHE cluster list she wants to know what is that story and is this safe to go? Oh, that, that is a great question and, and, and appreciate the opportunity to address that. Thank you. So, you know what, there was a cluster and, and, and what happened was, um, unfortunately, there was not a great mask wearing culture. And so one person within the clinic was positive and spread it to other members of that clinic. And so we have now tested every single person in the clinic and those who are positive are no law, they, they have to be there, they're still, they have a job, but they are not going to be in the clinic until they have met the mandatory quarantine requirements after having been positive. The other people who have tested negative can go back and work. They all have to have masks on. And in fact, we now know, because we work very closely with the clinic, that the uh, entire clinic is doing an outstanding job of wearing masks. And they probably can now testify to how important it is to wear a mask. And so I think now it's probably one of the safest places you can be because we've done a, a lot of work. Our infection prevention uh, and control teams have been down working with that program as well as the rest of the health system, as well as folks from Great Bend. And so now I think it is a really safe place. But it all came down to whether or not people were following the pillars. If you follow those rules, 
you will be safe. And I think now that patients can feel very good about going into that practice because mask wearing and all the social distancing, it's all in place. It should be uh, you know, a very, very safe experience. So I think to Susan's question, I believe you can go back. I think you can feel very comfortable about going back. You have great confidence going back. Everybody has been screened. Everybody's been tested. So I think that uh, I think it's a, I think it's a safe place to be. Okay, Cindy says she and her husband have been putting off their cancer screenings, and she wants to know what difference does a few months make anyway in terms uh, of stages. Right. Yeah, that, that's just kind of scary. You said quivers yeah. up. I've been put, putting off my cancer screening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That that's really a, a very important question. So actually, the, uh, there was a recent study that actually directly addressed that. So. Um, because of COVID's impact on delayed screening and diagnosis, it actually this study actually estimates that this will impact to lead to 34,000 additional cancer deaths a year in the U.S. That's out. 34,000. So 34,000 is a very big number because in all of prostate cancer in the U.S., there's only 33,000 deaths a year only. 34,000 deaths caused by COVID because of delayed in screening and diagnosis and treatment is a major number. So a few months of delay really makes a huge difference in terms of cancer. Jamie, breast cancer has got to be the same way. It is. And part of the reason is we don't get to pick the kind of cancer that you're going to get. So there is such a spectrum across all types of cancers, but in particular in breast, from the severity, so to speak, or the aggressiveness of the cancer. And we have so many more opportunities if we can diagnose those early and implement treatment early to improve your survival, just like what Dr. Chen is talking about. Yeah, so, and I'll just tell you, I have prostate cancer. I've told you guys on the program this before and uh, caught it very early, fortunately, and a very good cohort should approximately live a very long time, be here and cause Hawkeye lots of problems. Um, but I, I got to tell you, if that hadn't gotten caught early, that could be a lot different story. And uh, I think that's what we all have to understand and know in this world that. Um, you don't, uh, delaying care is not good care. And as a cancer patient, I'll just tell you that just, just please don't do that. <laughs> it's not a good idea. Don't be so afraid of COVID. And remember, COVID isn't spread when we follow the rules of infection prevention and control. And you have to look no further than the inpatient ward here at KU or at Liberty or at Shawnee Mission or at St. Luke's or research, Overland Park, any of the hospitals that are here in the VA, any hospitals here in Kansas City or elsewhere, where people follow the rules of infection prevention and control of the disease is not spread. And so you need to feel comfortable and don't delay care. Don't be a statistic. Do the, do the thing that's going to take care of yourself and your loved one. It's what I'm going to do. I go back from my follow-up screening in October. I'm going to get my biopsies again. Oh, what fun. <laughs> but you know what? I'd rather do that than to delay that care and not find out what's going on. And if I can just add to that, I think the 34,000 number we all can do something about. I think it's about rescheduling your mammogram, colonoscopy, PSAs that were canceled previously. I think a lot of people, as you said, are still reluctant to go back to these appointments because of concerns about catching COVID. As we all have said, the clinic is probably the safest place there is to, if you were to leave your house, go to the store, go to the park, go to the gym, the clinic is probably the safest place to go to because of all the precautions and all the rigorous staff training related to COVID. Mm -hmm. And so it's a safe place to be. We can reduce that 34,000 number by minimizing delays. I think we can all take action to, to do that. Yeah, that is just gotta be true. And Jamie, I talk about some of the specific things that you guys do now, because I remember you've talked a little bit about it before and it was pretty amazing. Talk to us about those specific things you're doing to keep people safe when they come to the clinic. Well, the way we're just scheduling patients has made a very a significant impact. So trying to spread out, um, really utilizing telehealth because that obviously helps us see the same number of patients that we want to and previously saw in the course of a day, but it allows us to spread out some of those in-person visits. Um, it's from the second that you walk in the door, we're continuing with temperature screenings, um, indications throughout the waiting room to also help with social distancing, even providing a mask if you're unable to bring one with you. From a screening standpoint, we've been able to provide social distancing within the waiting areas, also the way that we're screening. 
um, patients even before they're coming in to some of these visits via telephone, I think helps. Um, we have meticulous sterilization of all the equipment prior um, or between every screening uh, mammogram or ultrasound or whatever the, the modality is that, that we're utilizing. Um, we're obviously implementing from the provider standpoint everything that you guys have been talking about as well. I think the other important thing that we get questions about is the safety of going to surgery. And that is where we have the capabilities of, um, and, and our preference obviously, is that we are testing all patients before they go to surgery. And that is incredibly important because of the increased mortality that's associated with patients going to surgery when they um, are, are, are tested positive and, and actively have COVID. So we're protecting patients at every element of this cancer journey. Yeah, it's so important. Just remember, this guy right here knows a lot more about coronavirus than anybody. He's got his mask on. Oh. So should you. Oh, hey, his just mask fell, fell below his nose. We're put above the nose. Who knows what happened? That doesn't work. This guy, he's got to run a football team and a car offense. He's going to help beat the Texans tonight. You watch Patrick Mahomes. He's got his mask on. So should you. All right. Um, Stephen wants to know, I wasn't here yesterday, so I don't know, but he claims that there was a wonky question about the reliability of positive tests, positive predictive value. In asymptomatic patients, a positive test statistically would represent a true positive only some of the time. What percent do the doctors believe would be a true positive? 50%? Do you know what he's talking about? Yeah, I do. I don't mm. remember that question from yesterday, question. though. Yeah, but we can answer the questions. We understand that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a question we get before. And yeah. it, it has to do a lot both with the sensitivity and specificity mm -hmm. and positive predictive of an individual test, which we know is different for a swab yeah. than, than saliva and antigen, and what the background prevalence is within the community, yes. which we don't truly know. We can estimate. We have a pretty good, we, we think we have a pretty good sense. I think it's around 1% or 2%, but, yeah. but uh, because that's what we know uh -huh. from our screening. Mm -hmm. We did mass screening when people went to KU, yeah. back to KU. So I think we have a pretty good sense of what the actual random values are. So Yeah, and I think that question will center on, uh, you know, in Dr. Leisman's words, no test is 100%. So I think what that test and maybe what, uh, what that question was centering on was more of the antigen testing. We know that the PCR testing, the molecular testing, that is the gold standard. That's what most places are using right now and what we have been using since the outset. Um, that's what the nasopharyngeal or NP swab. And we don't mean just an anterior one. We went the one that goes to the brain biopsy The, the far yeah. one, yeah. <laughs> that uh, sensitivity and positive predictive value is extremely high. Uh, he could be referring to the antigen testing, and this is similar to um, the influenza antigen testing, where we know, and I think it was probably about maybe a Great Ben question or any, something like that as well. We know that with the antigen testing itself, and that just essentially takes it from the anterior um, nasal area, that test um, positive and negative predictive value, sensitivity and specificity, really matter on how much uh, activity, how much disease is in the community. Um, again, the antigen test, we don't use that here. Some places are using that, uh, but that can have an effect on the positive predictive value, false positives, false negatives, things of that nature. So with that antigen testing, certainly right now for influenza, we do not recommend, our lab does not recommend using the antigen test because you are more likely right now with influenza to have a false positive than you are actually to have a true positive just because there isn't much influenza activity. So that positive predictive value, negative predictive value, really depends um, on the test itself. And for the antigen testing, what really helps is to know the amount of prevalence of disease in the community. That way you can discern if it's false positive, false negative. Certainly if there's not as much activity of the infection in the community, you are more likely to have a false positive test for the antigen test. The PCR test, the molecular test, is much more sensitive and specific with a higher predictive and negative predictive value. So hopefully that helped answer that question. And Marcia has kind of a follow-up question. She said, when testing for the virus, it seems like all positives are called COVID cases, adding to the COVID counts. If you're positive for the virus, SARS-CoV-2, 
why are you considered to have COVID-19 even if you have no symptoms? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, question. Actually, that's one of those shifts. We, we fly the plane as we build it. Yeah. And I think that the, just how we've used the terms has shifted since early March, Dan, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we talk about the infection, so we are picking up the infection. COVID-19 is the disease. That was a very good distinction. And we have... Is the virus, yeah. Sometimes we they just meld together. However, um, you know, when you do test positive for SARS-CoV-2 on the PCR, you are still considered a COVID-19 case. We don't know if you will never develop symptoms. We don't know if you are just pre-symptomatic um, or when you will develop symptoms within that uh, isolation or quarantine period. But that is a good distinction to make. Um, a lot of times they do just get lumped in together, but there is a very distinct um, uh, uh, difference between just SARS-CoV-2, the virus, and then COVID-19, which is the disease. In general, um, it is just all lumped together as one. Yeah, here's how I would love, here's how I would describe it. SARS-CoV-2 is the disease, is the virus that causes COVID-19. In order to test positive for SARS-CoV-2, your body has to be shedding the virus. By definition, you are therefore infected. And if you are infected, you have the disease. So that's I, that's how we can look at it. There are people who have it very severely, and there are people who have it without any symptoms. But if you're positive, you are shedding the virus. The virus has invaded your body. And by definition, at that point, you have COVID-19. I think that's how we should look at it. Sam says that obesity is a risk factor for COVID-19. He wants to know, is it also a risk factor for cancer? Ah, great question. Let's turn to our guests. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. But of course, Dr. Wagner can chime in as well. Obesity is actually a risk factor for several cancers. Uh, uh, including uh, some of the women's cancers, including pancreatic cancer. And actually reducing obesity is one of the best ways to not only, one, reduce cancer, but also for people who have cancer is also a great way to improve their longevity uh, and cure over time. Dr. Wagner, do you want to chime in as well? Um, I agree with everything you said. We also focus on this on our survivorship plans for patients with breast cancer because we know that obesity also can contribute to a higher risk of recurrence. So it's not just trying to avoid the first cancer. It also can um, help us reduce that risk of it, of it returning. Are there cancers in which it makes it harder to make the diagnosis? That is obesity making it just harder to make a diagnosis of, can of cancer. Jamie, is that something that, you're, you're, you, that your team has to take into account? Um, not as much oftentimes with the actual diagnosis, but it definitely can play a part in treatment um, because of um, some of the comorbidities that go along with having um, obesity at the time of your diagnosis. Oftentimes it's coupled with diabetes, um, high blood pressure, cart um, more extensive cardiac issues. And if those are not well controlled, then sometimes it can delay us getting to some of the treatment options because we have to get those controlled to safely implement the cancer therapy. Yeah, yeah I agree with the, the treatment piece. I think uh, sometimes obesity can make it harder to have mm -hmm. surgery to remove a cancer, mm -hmm. certainly for radiation. Some patients, I think uh, just really the, the body uh, can make it harder to deliver radiation to the precise location as well. Uh, and also, sometimes obesity can be related to more side effects from cancer treatment. So I think those are all important issues. Yeah. Can I ask a question? On yes, you can, Joe. Go <laughs> right ahead. You. You're I allowed to ask that. a yeah, question. I was wondering, can we define obesity in terms of both diseases? What is that? Five pounds overweight or 50 yeah, or 100? Yeah. or? I bet there's some good stuff about that around cancer. I, you know, I, you know I, I think obesity is probably actually a continuum and, and not really a defined yeah yes or no uh, a question. So I, I think, of course, I think we want the, a healthy way to, is to have a body mass index of 25 or below. So anything above 25, I think we would ask people to exercise diet to try to get it to the, to, to but, but you know, if you're above 25 or you're above 30, if you're above 35 or even 40 in terms of body mass index, I think every little bit uh, can make the cancer Makes worse. Makes a difference. Dr. Wagner, any further yeah. thoughts? And, and as a surgeon, I know that's got to affect sometimes your planning. I'm sorry, I, I lost you just a little bit there. I said as a surgeon, I know, no, I was just saying the surgical field, uh, body mass index does uh, impact how sometimes you have to approach a case. Yeah. Significantly. Um, the safety of the patient really um, comes into play, and it's not just from the surgical side of things, but anesthesia 
um, has a, a very big part of um, how they have to plan for that particular case. Sometimes it can limit some of our options. When we talk about reconstruction options for breast cancer patients, there's higher risk of complications when we have obesity. Um, and so it, again, it can just limit or we have to modify um, some of our approaches to treatment. Yeah, and I'll just add that you know I think sometimes you know I think a lot of times doctors talk about body mass index and people yeah. may not know exactly how to know what that is for themselves. So it's actually very easily available on the internet. Just Google BMI and there's calculators. You plug in your weight, you plug in your height, your number spits out, and I think yeah. it's really easy to figure out. Yeah. Yeah, you know, BMI, body, body mass index, is the most common thing that we use to address um, or define obesity. Some people have problems with that, but it is the most common thing to be used in the healthcare system. So certainly talk with your um, healthcare provider. Um, there are some caveats there, as for, for instance, if you have more muscle mass or something like that. But for the most part, body mass index is, in general, what most healthcare places use. And just to say, I think... We are not trying to make anybody feel bad about their, 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 their weight or their appearance or anything like that. And we're just trying to say, hey, these are the medical stories that we encounter every day. And as a pulmonary ICU doc, I would say that we know that people who have a very high body mass index, and that's in the 35, 40 and above range, 50 and above, we struggle to, to really deliver care because it's so difficult. And, and, and that just, that just is, that's an is thing. Again, not trying to make anyone feel guilty or bad, but trying to just be honest and answer the questions directly. Mm -hmm. It's an is thing. And, and, and it, you know, we, we, um, I, I don't pretend to know all the answers to, um, you know, weight concerns in the United States, but we do know that medically that it does make things harder the higher the BMI goes. Michael wants to know, what are the air filters and ventilation procedures that the hospital uses to stop the spread of aerosol particles versus the droplets? Yeah, that's a, also a great question, Dana. There's so many layers to that question. Yeah. At the beginning, it's we can say bad. that, yeah, yeah, we'd say that, well, first of all, how much of it is really spread by micro aerosol and how much of it's really uh, more droplets of particles yeah. and how big is a particle before you consider it an aerosol? Probably we could. We could fight about yeah. that question for hours, but but the reality is that most of the virus is spread, mm -hmm. and you have to remember you can't just get one piece of virus. It's right. really it's it's how much and how long mm -hmm. you're in contact with the virus. Those little micro particles that float in the air for a while are not the big spreaders. Yeah. It's the bigger droplets, which is why it's the air cloud that you breathe. You've seen our freezer videos before. It's that cloud that's around you. And it's when your clouds come in contact. And clouds come in contact because you don't have a mask, and, and then you're spreading the virus into around you, and then people come in contact with your mm -hmm. cloud. And if they're within three to six feet, especially, then that's going to, or closer, then that's going to put them at higher risk. And if they're there for more than 10 minutes, they're at higher risk. That's how the disease is really spread. Hospitals do a lot of things to try and make sure people stay safe. Our know, first thing is the masks that, that folks wear, and we require it of our visitors as well as our staff. But secondly, it's the airflow like this room. You can, you can sit here and feel the breeze in the room, and, and it's the air moving up and out that helps keep people safe. And that's called negative airflow. And if you can turn a room over every six minutes, that means that flow, when I breathe out, most of my air particles are going to go straight up. and out through the ventilation system. So we keep people really safe like that. Um, and there are rooms that are, have that kind of negative airflow and that some that don't, but the COVID patients are on the ones that do, Dana. Yeah, you know, and I, I think this question has come up before, especially early on, you know, how much does HVAC come into yeah. uh, play here? Really, you know, the study from the, the Princess cruise ship really didn't show any effect from the HVAC. It is still being looked at. This is one of the questions that is being looked at, one of the many. But right now, really, we don't really see that there's much evidence that HVHC systems are um, really significant in spread of the disease. I know a lot of places have gone above and beyond to get new filters and lighten their, um, their systems, things of that nature. Obviously, in the hospital, we have something different in the healthcare system compared to other places. But in general, it really hasn't found to be a significant or major cause of spread of, of the virus. Yeah, I think that's a good point because in the Princess cruise ship, it wasn't the HVAC system that was spreading the disease, it was people to people transmission. Right. Um, one thing to think about too, as we head into the fall season, and it's clearly feeling a lot more like fall now, um, we've said go outside, go outside, go outside. Hawk, that's gonna be a little more difficult mm -hmm. for people to oh, do. Yeah. So come October, November, December, January, 
than what happens with, with uh, our outside activities. Yeah. It's going to be a little bit more of a challenge. Yeah. Still have to encourage people, don't go into a lot of group settings inside yeah. because you're still going to be at risk. Make sure you wear a mask. Yeah. You know, I would say it is colder now, but... You know, summer doesn't end until September 21st, so we still got some weeks. <laughs> it's always bet. hot you on bet. Art Fair weekend. Unfortunately, there's no Art Fair weekend yeah. this year. Um, but going, so the patios are going to be less uh, dense. It's going to be harder to fill, especially in the colder weather. All of these restaurants that have done a very good job of opening up and spreading out um, and using outdoor seating or using more outdoor spaces, it is going to be more difficult. And so moving into the fall and winter, it is going to be a little bit more risky to go into those restaurants and things. Hopefully there will still be enough uh, space and uh, less density when you do go to those restaurants. But it will be something of a concern as we move forward. Yeah, something to keep our eye on. One more question. Yeah, I've been saving Max's question. Okay, Max, here we go. Uh -oh. Yeah, he is going to the Chiefs game tonight. He's yeah. been listening to some of the advice that we've been giving. He wants to know, he knows he can keep his mask on, but how's he going to keep safe from the other people around him? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question, Hawk. So we've worked a little with the Chiefs yeah. on their safety plan. Really, the NFL has done a good job. Yeah. We're trying to put that together. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to the game. I don't know if you are. I don't know if any of our team is. Um, but um, just because I'm 60 years old and, you know, and, and I'm, a I'm a cancer patient. So I said, that's probably not the right thing to do. And, uh, and, and work in a healthcare care setting. Don't want to take mm -hmm. any risks around that. So, um, but I think you probably can go to a game safely. Yeah. Wearing your mask does offer some protection. If somebody around you doesn't have a mask on at the game, uh, here's what I would do. First of all, I'd try to move away a little bit. Yeah. And second of all, I would get the stadium officials because the Chiefs are going to be patrolling the game. Not the players, of course, but uh, the, they have staff in the stadium. And they'll go around and remind people to put on a mask. And I believe if you don't wear a mask, you can actually have the ass to leave the stadium. So I think it's, you know, I think they are got measures in place to keep fans safe. and. If I remember right, the Chiefs have said we're going to try this for the first three games and make sure we're not spreading the disease before we decide on the next five games for, for in-person uh, fans. So. Yeah, you know, I think with, with their plan, I think seating, sitting down, watching the game, I think you can be very safe. Um, if you're up walking, either getting into the stadium, getting out of the stadium, going to get concessions, going to the restroom, have your mask on. Wear, bring eye protection if you can, either a face shield or goggles um, if you have them. If you can space yourself out from other people when doing those things, six, eight, ten feet is a lot better. Um, that'll be a good thing too. I think sitting in your seat, you're probably going to be safe. With the weather as it is right now, there's probably going to be pretty turbulent airflow. Nothing's going to stay around very long. Any uh, virus that is dispersed, if people are wearing their masks and there is some that comes out, it's going to be um, in such low concentrations and probably fall to the, to the ground very easily. But I think you can be safe in the stadium at your seat for sure. And you can look cool with goggles on. Yeah, like I that. Just make, I just want to make sure yeah. that everybody knows that. Looks good. All right, well, as we wind down today, I want to talk to Dr. Wagner and Dr. Chen first. So, so Dr. Wagner, final thoughts for, for our listening audience and viewing, viewing audience this morning. Um, I just really want to strongly encourage everyone out there to continue to put their health care um, at the forefront. And I feel like we are doing that when we when we talk about the pandemic and everything we've been talking about today and every other morning that, that you and Dana are here. Um, but that also has to do with your healthcare beyond um, trying not to get COVID-19. It has to do with early detection of cancer and screening over decades have been highly successful at early detection and improving patient survival. And we are here to help support you in every way possible. Um, so please reach out. Yeah, great advice. Dr. Chen. Well, I, I have to mention that we're in September and September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month and October is Breast Cancer Month. And so I think this is really a great opportunity. But, but I think in terms of Prostate Cancer Awareness Month, it's about screening, it's about treatment. Uh, and I know that sometimes men could be a little stubborn and reluctant to get their prostates uh, checked. Uh, and so I think this is really important uh, for us to emphasize. And I also want to mention that we actually, the Masonic Cancer Alliance is actually sponsoring a free prostate cancer screening event this Saturday uh, from 9 to 1 at five different locations in different parts of town. Really, I think, to make up for the, the, the delays that COVID has impacted in, in men. So I think this is really important. It's an opportunity. People can just walk in or sign up online. It's absolutely free. 
and you get your result in a, in a week or two. So I think if we have men who are viewing, we encourage you to get your prostate cancer screening. If we have women uh, who are related to men in some way, we encourage you to encourage your men to do that because sometimes we could be reluctant to do that. So I think this is a really important event and it happens in September, which is the prostate cancer month. Yeah, thank you for that. And, is there and, an age that men should be yeah, screened? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the guidelines indicate that usually prostate cancer screening should probably happen for men 50 or older. For some men who have higher risk, if you have a family history of prostate cancer or African American men, because there, there's a higher likelihood of prostate cancer, that's age 40. So 50 for most men, 40 for higher risk men for prostate cancer screening. And family history of, of prostate cancer? Absolutely, 40. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, and I'd just say again for all you guys out there, don't delay. Get your screening yeah. done as a guy with it. Let's 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 make sure we we take good care of that and and uh, don't 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 uh, don't squander that opportunity. Yeah. Final thoughts. Well, and if you're 50 and getting screened for prostate cancer, remember to get your shingles vaccine as well. That is very <laughs> important. Nobody wants to get shingles. Uh, I want to thank my mom for keeping Tony and Patrick safe. Yeah, as mom, Jamie wait, wait, alluded wait, 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 wait. to. Time out. I know. Whoa, it was that down. Mask is falling down. We'll, we'll get it back right up. Uh, get it back up. Okay, go ahead. He's usually pretty good about wearing a mask. <laughs> Tony is. Um, but to Jamie's point, the mask culture is getting better. I think, and, and, and to Dr. Stites's point, as we are getting, you know, going to be moving into the fall and the winter, continue to wear the mask, continue to evaluate your surroundings. It will become second nature where you will be able to stay spaced from people, where you will go to those de-densified areas or restaurants and not meet in those large groups. If we can continue to do that, I've been optimistic because in the Kansas City Metro, our rolling seven-day average is, is pretty good right now compared to where it was a week ago. So if we can keep those low test numbers, keep those low hospitalization numbers, you know, we will be looking good moving into respiratory viral season, influenza season, as well as the COVID pandemic. Yeah, it means everything, doesn't it? Yeah, we want to keep following the Chiefs. I want to say a special thanks to, to, to Dr. Wagner and to Dr. Chen for being with us today. Great job. Always welcome back. Um, a reminder about tonight's pregame show that's going to feature Amanda Gartner, our, uh, our head of infection prevention and control. We need to get her back down here as well. Um, she does an amazing work at helping keep our, our team safe. Um, you know, remember we've talked about the 50 reasons to wear a mask. You've heard the song, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. This is 50 Reasons to Wear a Mask, to Love Your Mask. And I think we're going to have those up soon. Uh, I can make up about 30 of them right now. But I will challenge all of you to help send in pictures of your photo or uh, mask wearing and also the reasons why you wear a mask. And remember, we won Super Bowl 54, the drive to 55. Here we go. Hashtag <laughs> run it back. To all of our all other folks out there, thank you guys so much for being with us today. We'll be back here tomorrow. We're going to be answering your questions, Hawkeye and I, I are. And uh, we look forward to seeing you here with us in the program. And as you know, go Chiefs. We'll see you tomorrow.